Well, we've got uh, Globetrotting Canadian on the phone here. Man, I uh, I wanted to call him a little bit before, but I knew I wasn't allowed to talk about certain other things until December 4th. So the end of the Australian Supercross season uh, kind of coincides perfectly with this conversation. So we've got Cole Thompson on the line, fresh back from Australia. Cole, thanks for chatting with us, buddy. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. So obviously there's a, a few things to talk about here. Uh, but first of all, you're home now, right? You're back home? I'm currently in Florida right now. Florida. Okay. Well, you said home sweet home on your Instagram home. post. Yeah, home home to my dog. Ah, oh, gotcha, gotcha. Now, where... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you used to always be in Florida. Are you, where, where do you go in Florida now? Uh, right now I'm near Destin, um, pretty much where I grew up, uh, near my parents' place there in Camelot City. Oh, okay, okay. So you're in that familiar area that you used to always go when you rode at County Line and all that stuff. Yeah, good old days. <laughs> all right, buddy. Well, we got to obviously the big thing is you just finished second in the Australian Supercross 250 uh, series. But uh, backing it up, I mean, um, hey, you've never been to Australia before, right? Correct. Yep, never been. Okay, well, how did, uh, I mean, who started speaking to you and how did this come up back in, uh, back when it first started? Uh, funny enough, it was um, right before round one of the Canadian series. Uh, Joe Skid had messaged me um, saying that he had a contact reach out to him, and it uh, was for the Australian 250 and Yamaha. And I was, you know, right away I said, yeah, like 100%, you know, if you can get them in contact or give me a contact, I'll reach out. And uh, I actually reached out pretty much the next day um, when I was at Gopher Dunes for the first round. and. I uh, didn't hear anything back for uh, like a week or so. And then they got back to me and they're like, ah, oh, the position might be filled and, you know, we'll, we'll keep you in mind if something happens. And then didn't hear back for probably another two, three weeks. And then I got the call randomly and they said, hey, would you be interested in coming? It didn't work out with the other guy. And I didn't even hesitate, didn't even ask <laughs> what money there was, didn't ask anything, just said, yeah, like, uh, I just want to go race somewhere um, you know, outside of Canada and something that's new and on a good program. And they were, uh, you know, cool with uh, giving me the opportunity. And that's kind of how it, it kind of sparked me uh, going over there. It was just basically just saying yes to whatever opportunity I got. Wow, man, that's, re that's really cool. Now, obviously, you don't have a whole lot of um, commitments to, you know, brands and things over here. Would it have mattered what brand it was or just, I mean, it's obviously good because you've been on a Yamaha, but did that actually matter? So a little bit of it was um, I was trying to keep uh, my part scan the thing going with Thor, but obviously that was the only kind of like commitment I had in Canada because of them taking care of me for Supercross and then all through the summer and stuff and supporting my racing. And they're basically the, the reason that I was able to keep racing. So oh. thanks, thankfully Parts Canada was actually able to um, basically just let me out a little bit earlier of my contract so I could go over there and race. Other than that, like, I didn't have any huge commitments with Yamaha or anything. I didn't have any commi commitments with the Canadian series. So um, the biggest thing I was looking for was staying on Yamaha because that, that was the bike of choice that I'd gone with after I'd left KTM. Right. So when it was Yamaha and it was factory support and I knew that the program had uh, brought over Jacob Pays in the past, uh, it was, like, you know, a, a, a very um, – I guess something that I was really, really interested in doing. So that was uh, part of it too. Like I, I didn't want to go over a lot of Cowie because, you know, I had no time on Cowie. So I knew right. I wanted to stay on the same bike. So I felt right at home when I landed. Right. So it wasn't uh, completely necessary, but it was just awesome that it worked out that way. Correct. Nice, man. Hey, now it is something obviously we never talk about in uh, in Canadian moto, that's for sure. But so was there some money involved or was it simply uh, results based or how, how was that? Uh, just results based. So uh, I told them going in, that's all I wanted. And then uh, they took care of everything for me. So um, my stay, uh, I had it covered and then uh, like I had a vehicle there, my training, my riding, everything. So it was you know, basically a, a boot camp to get ready for the AMA stuff as well as, um, and uh, it was just more or less them kind of take care of me and then just race the bonuses. So that was, that was the plan. Nice, nice. Now I know you had one, uh, you know, kind of one little blip where you kind of 
well, I guess two where you weren't on the actual podium, but to otherwise, I guess you're pretty happy with the with the way that went then with the the bonus structure. Yeah, yeah, no, it was good. Um, it was uh, two rounds there that uh, I didn't do so well. No, first one uh, or not first. First one went all right. I got second. The second one, I crashed with another guy on like opening lap in the main event, and then I had another crash when I was coming through the pack, and it ended up finishing seventh. And then uh, round three. I felt really good, and it just didn't get off to the best of starts. And uh, it was only short main event, uh, six lap main event. Hmm. So there's three of them. And then ended up fourth that night. And then the final race was a two eight lap main event race, and um, able to go uh, three two for the overall. Nice, yeah. Three of you guys tied in points for that one. Correct. Yeah, that's pretty wild, especially in uh, Olympic scoring. That's kind of that's kind of wild too. But uh, okay, so. Well, okay, so you'd never been before, and the first round was October twenty first in in Melbourne. So, like, what did you know? When did they? When did you go over there? And I mean, Chloe was with you on the first trip as well. How did it all work out, and uh, with that sort of thing? So I flew over uh, two weeks prior to round one, and then Chloe came over um, four four weeks after I left. So she was there from the halfway point of my trip. Okay, okay, because there was a. Um you know, a month break between Adelaide and Newcastle. So uh, were you, did you stay down there and just kind of hang out? Yeah, no, I, um, I then opted to stay like the team wanted me to stay. And I was, I was keen on staying and, and getting to ride their bike a bit more and, and just get more, I guess, adjusted. Um, it was kind of a bummer that the series was only four rounds because I felt like we were just getting better as it kind of progressed. So yeah, the the plan was always to stay over there, not fly back, and just keep riding with their their um, their bike and their program kind of thing. Okay, awesome. Now I got I had a couple like obviously somebody goes to Australia. I got some silly questions because here in uh, the northern hemisphere, over here in North North America, like obviously we think of Australia, we think of these weird spiders, you know, whatever, all kinds of bugs and things. What was that like? I mean, you were you kind of in the same sort of area down there in the southeast of the country. What, uh, what kind of experience did you have with that? Like, was it pretty wild? Uh, we didn't see any spiders what? other than a few here and there, but nothing of the size that, that they show you online. And then <laughs> for the snakes, I seen a python, like, the second day I was there. It was above my truck, and it was <laughs> uh, curled up in a tree branch above the truck. And uh, that that kind of set me off. I was like, that's not a great feeling. But for the most part, yeah, we didn't really get – uh, into any insects or spiders or anything like that, so uh, I can't say that I actually had the the full scare of Australia. <laughs> it's, it's funny because I mean, being I, I'm a surfer, so I kind of think of obviously sharks and things too, and jellyfish and everything. But um, I'm guessing, right. did you go to any beaches when you were there? I went swimming once. Yeah, we lived. So where I lived, I was they they had a house for me at the beach. Like I was a uh, hundred feet from the beach. Wow. And then um, where the track was, was only like five minutes from there. So I was at the track and then I was at the, at the water, but I never went in any water that was like above pretty much knee deep. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't swimming with any sharks or <laughs> even considering swimming with sharks. <laughs> so I'm assuming you didn't try surfing. Did not try surfing. Nope. I didn't even, didn't even think of it. I was like, I'm good. I'm good on land. All right. Okay. Well, okay. So, um, like actual tracks itself and stuff like that. So, I mean, you kind of went over briefly what, uh, you know, you kind of jumped in there right away with some results and things like that. But, uh, Max Anstey almost kind of ran the table and stuff. Were you surprised by him? Were you close with him? Were you, you know, were you guys talking, practicing stuff like that? What about uh, Max? Yeah, he wrote good. Um, he's, uh, he went back during the break. So only time I really talked to Max and she, their team's based out of Melbourne. My team was based out of Brisbane, so I was north of Brisbane, and he was uh, in Melbourne, which is like I think 12 to 15 hours apart. Hmm. So we never seen each other at the tracks or anything. But when I did talk to him, yeah, good, like everything was good, no issues, and he rode good and fair, and and, and he was obviously quite a bit quicker in the earlier rounds and stuff. I felt like um, he was just race ready, where I was kind of still getting like familiar with things and even like at the end there um you know like round three and four and stuff like that like I didn't feel like he was out of reach but he was definitely still the guy to beat so um you know it would have been nice to have more than just four rounds but at the same time it was uh it was good to 
get over there, get racing with them, kind of wake up and see like, you know, what the actual speed is and how much more I got to go and work on and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, it was good to have him as like, you know, a good benchmark and someone to strive to get up to. Okay. Now was uh, like, is everything basically the same as what you're used to? I mean, obviously we, uh, aside from the stuff, uh, the, uh, the drains draining the opposite way and stuff like that. But uh, going to practice tracks, does everything just feel like at home or did you just kind of know you're in Australia? Did it feel different? What, to, you know, the tracks, any, anything different? Uh, I'd say the tracks are definitely uh, slicker. So like dirt wise, it's a lot harder. Like I thought my track at home and you've been there, you've seen how hard packed it is. Mm-hmm. I thought that was hard packed, but I have a new understanding of what hard packed is and it's Australia. Um, <laughs> it's something that, I don't even know if you can even make the dirt uh, anywhere else or simulate it. It's one of a kind. So that, that was an adjustment for me. It made it easier going to the races on the weekend because a lot of the tracks that we practiced on, I felt like were slicker than the tracks we raced. So it did help kind of get, because the tracks that you race are slick too, right. but they're not, they weren't as slick I found. So um, that helped. And then, uh, as far as day-to-day stuff it felt like home to me it honestly went by really really quick uh like you know i'd be riding four days a week training um you know six days a week and it was probably the sickest boot camp or is the sickest boot camp you could have i mean i was in you know 85 to 95 degree weather every single day so it was hot training um made it hot on the bike and then you know in the afternoons you'd have the afternoons you'd be done riding by one o'clock and have the afternoon to go to the beach reset kind of go to the gym whatever and i was like man this is (laughs) this is better than anything i've had you know in the past you know in canada till december something like that Mm -hmm. trying to ride in snow and rain all that stuff so it made it really really nice all right obviously heading into christmas down there means you're heading into summer which must have been weird yeah yeah that's what they kept saying so their summer is just beginning and I kept on getting it confused. It's like, obviously, like our season's winter, right? But they're going opposite, right? It's spring into summer there right now. I don't get how that happens with a flat earth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so was the uh, was your team, was your team pumped with your results and stuff like that? Happy with it? And does this mean uh, anything for the future? Uh, I don't know what it means for the future, but yeah, like the team, even on my bad weekends, were really supportive. Like they knew, they like, to be honest with you, I've run for a lot of teams and, and, and very few teams get like the racer side of things. So like when things aren't going good and, and they weren't at times, you know, when I had some bad races, they were really good at understanding that like, you know, I was given a hundred percent and that like, it just sometimes it didn't work out my way. But, uh, I, man, I would love to go back down and do it again with them. They're beyond, um, supportive and understanding and like they would, you know, I'd have a mechanic at the track, you know, two, three times a week with me, whether it be working on suspension, whether it be trying different tires, and just just in general, just trying to always make me better on the bike. And I'm like, man, yeah, that's, that's hard to find. And it was something that, like, I wanted to get back to this level so badly this year. And then for it to all come, you know, kind of like at the last minute, it was just like, man, so surreal. Like, being over there, I was like, you know, the beginning of January, I was just praying I got on track for Anaheim and then to be in, you know, in Australia racing and, having it as like a full-time job again was like i felt like a kid in a candy store nice man is that uh, looking back that best experience you've had so far or what that sounds pretty wild yeah yeah no it was good i think the <laughs> living and everything that went with the racing side of it just made it like the, the friends that i have over there now and stuff like that it's nice you know like for so many years i think i got uh painted as this villain or this terrible person in Canada, it was kind of just nice to have a fresh start. Like even the racers I raced with and stuff was like, there was all like respect and, and, and sort of just like a, like literally like I hit the reset button and stuff. And um, for so many years in Canada, it was like, you know, if I looked at somebody the wrong way, it was like protest or, you know, all oh, that's Thompson. And I, I was just so frustrated with it. And I think it, I was getting to that point again this year with, you know, being back in Canada racing. And you could see it on my face and sorry, I wasn't smiling as much. And I was just kind of just like, almost in a sense, like I needed something to pull me out of there and just kind of hit the, the reset on my career. And that was kind of Australia for me. And that's how I felt at the beginning of the year when I raced in the States too, was that same feeling of just feeling like happy, you know, and, and it, it, it sometimes it, and it's people in the sport that kind of drag you down 
and that's where I was at. Like in Canada, I was just like, I just needed something different. Well, it's it's funny you say that because uh, I mean, yeah, you when I saw you out uh, out west last year, it was a new coal. You were happy, smiling. We had great conversations, fun interviews, and stuff like that. And then we get to Canada, and, and the smile disappeared from you again. And now you say you went, uh, you had to go away to get it. So it's uh, it's it's kind of wild how that works, huh? Yeah, I think um, I, you, I think you get to a point, and it's just like you know you can only put on a face for so long in Canada, and um, you know like obviously <laughs> my brother's running it and stuff. Um, you know I support them, and I wish them you know like success in it. But for me, racing up there, it's just been like the last few years, and it's funny the same people that I've had issues with, and you know you try to make it right or try to move on from it, they seem like they're the same people that constantly drag you down. So. I felt like I was getting dragged down and I felt like, you know, from whether it be a certain person commentating or certain people talking on podcasts about me. And I was just like, they wouldn't even ask me my side of the story or even care for my side of the story. You know, I've reached out to people and, um, and told them, you know, like there were certain things that came up around the middle of summer that really bugged me and put an end to me racing in the summer and I was over it. And then I came back for arena cross and supercross and, still kind of over it towards certain people and like I said I just needed something different and I think when I got that call that the Australian thing came up it was more or less like I knew I had already committed to Sarnia so I raced Sarnia and that weekend in itself was more than enough to do me in I was uh I was over getting t-boned I was over feeling like I had just a bullseye on my back and I was ready to just get out and start something well, it's funny you say that because I know what, uh, I mean, obviously I've known you a long time and uh, even, you know, traveled with your family for goodness sakes back in the day and stuff. But I could just see it in your face, like at the Canadian races, like in Sarnia, for example, you just weren't happy. And I'm like, you know what, I, man, I got to go talk to him. So I just went up and, you know, I had to break through your, you know, your angry look on your face. And as soon as we started talking, everything was great. And we had a great conversation, but you could just tell that, uh, you know, you're, you just weren't happy. Yeah, well, that one in Sarnia was just more or less stressed about you not know, getting hurt and stuff as well because I'd already committed. Right. But, yeah, there was a frustrating weekend because um, I always said, I'm like, man, I, I understand, like, rubbing and, and aggressive racing part of it. But then there's, like, certain times where it's, like, there'd be races that I'd, I'd race fairly, like, um, one of the kids, I can't remember his name, but he raced up there this summer, and uh, I made a pass on him that was – not aggressive, nothing, no contact. And I go into the next corner and I, I'm go, I'm turning on the inside and I just get a bike right up into the side of me. And, you know, I go down, he stays up, he teed me up. And I remember being so like, like, what is this? Like, what does it even mean? Like, there's just no respect there. Like, I'm just like, whatever. And I came off the track and I just said, man, like, I didn't even feel like you attempted to turn the corner. You just used me as the corner. And I remember he was like saying, oh, I'm just a kid and you're just mad that loss. And I'm like, Man, I'm not mad at anything. I'm just, I'm just frustrated. That there's just no respect. And then the next night or whatever, I get, you know, teed up again. I made a pass, I think, on Tanner that was fair. And I thought, you know, racing Tanner for the years, I, I'm like, you know, like I can leave the door open with Tanner because he's raced super cross. He understands it. Like, let's get the race going, kind of thing. And the next corner, he puts me into the almost into the thing, and I was like, come on, man. I'm like, I'm Tanner. I'm like, Tanner wouldn't even bump a fly out of the way yet. He parked me over a berm. I'm like, okay. I was like, clearly there's messages to be sent. So that was a little bit of me just being like, all right, clearly I'm a, I'm a target for the indoor series as, as someone to bump. And like I say, I people can say, oh, he's a crybaby. He just can't take what he gives and stuff like that. You can call it that. But at the same time, both people that I passed, I passed without making contact, without even getting near them. And I was more or less just anticipating them to kind of just get on with the race at that point. But clearly they both felt so and then between that and just being like in a setting where off the start you got people jumping by you and i wasn't getting the best starts and you're like you know looking above you beside you and rain across is chaotic man and it's hard to it's hard to have a smile on 24 7 well the only thing you can do there is you got to flip that uh psychologically you're obviously the guy that everyone knows that is going to win it so they have to do anything they can right <laughs> so take it as a compliment i guess yeah, yeah, no, you could for sure. And I, I honestly, it didn't, it didn't really, I shouldn't say that it wasn't just that there was more behind the scenes too that was that was bugging me, and I don't want to get into it. But sure, sure. yeah, there was there was a lot of things in that weekend that just 
I think that part was kind of like just icing on the cake is getting teed up and kind of more or less was just like, all right, I've had enough. I'm, I'm good. Right. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because, I mean, I know obviously I've seen seen you in the past racing Supercross north and south of the border and sometimes you have to put someone. I know you had obviously a battle with someone we all know back in the day, but you, I remember the exact thing you're talking about. You stood someone up in the corner, didn't make contact, made the pass, perfect supercross pass and then you just got like you say teed up and knocked fly <laughs> and knocked flying but uh so i understand what you're saying there for sure but uh i'm gonna stick with the uh i gotta take it as a compliment because it's the only way guys up here are gonna beat you <laughs> yeah maybe um <laughs> and it's not it, it, it's like i say it's no disrespect to the ride or whatever it's just that's my take on it and people can run with it take it however they want that's just my side of it all right. Well, we kind of there was a beautiful segue to get to your new stuff, but uh, I'm going to ruin the segue and go back a couple of seconds. What was what's the food like in Australia? I want to <laughs> talk some silly stuff again uh, to change the subject there. But I saw you with that picture, the last one up on Instagram there. But uh, so what was the food like down there? Is it similar or different? Uh, very similar. I thought I thought Australia in general was very similar to Canada. Um, the food that we ate was pretty much the standard uh, stuff. But we did get into like some Australian food. There was a couple things that we tried. Uh, one of them, they like they're big on these chicken. Um, par- they call them chicken parmies, uh, <laughs> which was one of the things that like actually Chloe really liked. It was, it was just like basically chicken. Uh, I think we have them actually, but just chicken with like some pizza sauce and ham and cheese and stuff like that, and then uh, deep fried. And then they had these like uh, things called tin tans, which is like a popular oh, yeah. cookie. Yeah, oh, yeah, I know those. To me, I, like, I, like, I love sweets, so, like, I love those, but I didn't, like, actually get into them too often. I just tried one one time. And then, uh, for the most part, like, the last couple of weeks that we were there, we just kind of ate, like, from home and stuff like that just because it was easier, and we just cook up basically your standard, like, chicken, vegetables, rice, that stuff. Right. Yeah, I know. I used to uh, in Vancouver. I used to, I used to always make sure we had at least one Australian on on staff at our running shop and stuff. And they always had like tin tins getting sent up from Australia and stuff. So, yeah, yeah, pretty funny how those. Uh, certainly, you didn't try Vegemite. I did try Vegemite. Actually, yeah, that was one of the things I tried. Neither, neither one of us liked it. No, it's not good. But we didn't mix it right. The Australians said that you got to mix it with more butter or something, and we just mixed it just straight to toast. <laughs> nice yeah it's funny I'll show so, it to you we messed that up you have to short form everything too everything's got a short form to it the sayings <laughs> yeah 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 that's what I said they, they rolled up their tongue easy everything they say yeah hey now you mentioned uh, I'm obviously with uh, Joe Skid being kind of the the initial kind of connection and then you mentioned guys being you know your training and stuff How like suspension wise and everything you had to, who was helping you with that and everything that was like right away those guys were really keen on getting suspension going yeah, originally they asked me if I wanted to bring my suspension, and I was kind of, I was like, I don't really want to fly with it over there just in case it gets held at a customs or whatever. So they had a setup that they'd run, and I'm kind of pretty open about suspension because I, I firmly believe even with my time that I raced in Canada, you can't get away with just running like one setup for everywhere. Like my Canadian setup, Supercross setup, well, I didn't have one this year. I ran stock stuff, but <laughs> usually like when I worked with Steve, um, me and Steve would go to a completely different setup than we'd run in the States for Supercross because of the way that the tracks are built. So I, I asked them, I was like, what do you guys run over there is what I'll start with. Kind of like, you know, I told my weight and stuff. And the first weekend, uh, or the first week I was there, I actually struggled because I was really, really stiff and the tracks are hard packed, like I was saying. Mm, right. So the first week I just progressively just went softer. And then I got to a point where I was like, all right, it's going through the whoops good, goes through the whoops good, but, um, you know, it's not giving up too much in the corners. And that setup was pretty close to what I finished with, uh, a couple tweaks here and there. But it was, um, they have, um, my mechanic there was the suspension guy for the team. So my mechanic and suspension was kind of like the same as what I used to have with Steve, um, which was nice. Okay, cool. Hey, one one last thing on Australia there too. With uh, obviously with Chad Reed being so big, what was uh, Chad Reed hanging out at the races and stuff like that? What uh, was? Did you talk to him? I didn't talk to Chad. No, but I seen him. So he was at round one promoting it for the World Supercross as well as the kickoff for the Australian Series, and then he was again back for Newcastle, which was okay. his home race, um, which was round three. Oh, uh, okay, okay, all right. 
Cool, man. All right. Uh, yeah, it's funny. I don't think people realize just how big of a star he is in as a sports figure in Australia. It's kind of wild to see that. That just doesn't happen here. Yeah. Yeah, no, he's, he's well known. Good dude. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let, moving on now. I, I let's just real briefly. That's uh, kind of wrapped up the Australian talk, though, man. That's awesome. Finished second in the series. Um, now, had, I, I was driving. I can't even remember where I was driving in the states, and had uh, both our buddies and fellow Canadian Chris Elliott give me a call and kind of break the news that uh, you're heading that way. So, what's uh, what's the plan now for the team solitaire for you? Is it official? I don't know. <laughs> oh. oh, everybody's um, been talking about it. Uh, okay, uh, maybe it's, well, it's not official because he hasn't posted it up yet, but uh, everybody knows. I don't know. Can you yeah, say anything? Maybe? I, I, I can't comment on that situation yet. All right, guess not. Because uh, the team will have plans to, to I'm sure, will be announcing it shortly no. or something. No, no, just between just between the two of us. I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> all right well yeah we won't uh, we heard rumors that you're on that one okay that makes sense well, we, but we have obviously all heard rumors that you're heading 250 west for solitaire but that's all we can say i guess so good luck with that and we'll see you out there um all right well i guess uh, i guess that's a short conversation about that then for this time <laughs> i was told december 4th yeah, we were allowed we'll, to say we'll have to catch up in a week or so we'll uh, have to go see what, what's next but uh yeah, for sure. I can confirm. Obviously, I'll be racing Supercross in the States again this year and obviously doing it with a bit more support than I did last year. Um, <laughs> even though it was fun last year and I would love to do it again, it was uh, not in the cards. I didn't have time to, obviously, with this Australian thing coming up. But even prior to that, I just didn't have time to, um, <laughs> I guess, take on the stress of putting a, a, a race program together and then going out there and doing the trucking, the mechanicing, and riding again kind of on my own so <laughs> it was fun uh, once to find <laughs> seek support yeah it was it was a good time once right yeah i said it was cool to do it and it was um it was awesome the support from like uh the people um you know uh, on social media and just at the tracks the people that would come up and meet me um and i think it's because of it's being so relatable right we all get into racing and at some point you know, you, you lose support and you got to kind of go out and do it on your own. And I was doing it on my own and, and, and trying to make the most of it. And it was a great, uh, it was a great deal. It, it brought a lot of smiles, maybe a little bit of gray hair, but hmm. lots of laughs and smiles with it. Yeah, I think that was a cool reset button you hit. And it, like you say, it, it kind of switched gears back to the, the fun aspect of it and you and Chloe kind of working away and stuff. So that was that was cool to see. Now, um, obviously, we okay, we can't talk about uh, the officialness of the team and everything, but when will you be, we can talk about when you're heading out west and stuff. When, uh, when are you going there and where will you be training and stuff? Uh, I'll actually be flying out um, on Thursday. Oh, so wow, I'll be okay. up there for a couple of days and then I'm going to fly back home to Canada to get my stuff and basically home for four or five days, and then I'll start trekking out there to be out there for basically um, around December 15th to 17th, around that time. Okay, you taking the big rig out again to, to live in and stuff? Yeah, it worked out good last year, having my stuff with me, and I've, I've done it the last couple of years, where, um, even when I was with KTM, and it's just nice when you uh, have all your stuff with you, and then last year i was able to race out of it this year um i won't be racing out of it, but i'll still take it to all the all the the venues and all the races because it's nice to like you know i would literally pull in there on friday and you just you're just chilling you don't have to worry about where you're gonna eat you don't have to worry about where you're gonna sleep just you get there you hang out you're ready to track got all your stuff with you wake up in the morning right there <laughs> yeah, you're always easy to find in the parking lot, the big white rig with the MX Schools license plate, Ontario. So that's uh, easy for me, too. <laughs> yeah, I hope I won't be behind that, uh, or they won't have the so, so many times this year. <laughs> okay, so you're obviously flying out there, so we'll have some official photos and everything. So then we'll, uh, obviously that's what's going on. So we'll have the official news next week, I'm assuming, but uh, so we won't, uh, we won't say any more. But uh, it's good news that you're going to have the support that uh, you certainly deserve and uh, 250 and then we got to get you up there in the 450 soon too well that's the plan is to actually do um a couple 450 rounds in the east so after the stint that i do in the west which is only four rounds this year i want to as it moves the series moves east um do a handful of rounds in the 450 just because the west has a bit of a break there um in between i think it's anaheim and then 
to go to Seattle. I don't even remember where it goes next one, but there's a bit of a break there that gives me some time. So uh, the goal, like obviously, was last year to do a few rounds in the 450, and that's still the same goal this year. Oh, okay, awesome. That'll be okay. That's good to good to hear. Cool. People will be happy to hear that. That'll be good. Uh, so we'll catch you in the West, and we'll catch you in the East as well. Cool. All right, Cole. I don't. I mean, uh, I don't want to yeah. keep keep you too much longer. I appreciate you taking the time to go over that with us and everything, man. It was cool to. Uh, I found a, I, I got this weird cable package thing going on here, and I found a PK Sports or something like that was showing some of the Australian rounds. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, so I was able to find some Australian uh, TV channel that was showed the one round anyway. But uh, that was cool. Congrats on the second place, man. And uh, anything we didn't talk about, I think we pretty much covered all of it, huh? Yeah, no, thanks for uh, thanks for calling and uh, catching up. Obviously, always good to uh, debrief after a while. <laughs> now, do you want to officially thank anyone or anything while we got you on here, or uh, are we good? Oh, uh, yeah, just thank you to Circo. Um, you know, kept my uh, my racing dream alive, and obviously uh, it was kind of funny to see where I started the year versus where I ended the year from doing it on my own to basically having uh, an entire team support me uh obviously when i was there my teammate got hurt and then the fill-in rider brad west got hurt too so it was kind of an unfortunate deal for the team where they had some injuries and then it obviously that's why i was there in the first place was because of some injuries they had during the season and um i was happy to obviously finish up the season for them but just it was pretty surreal to me that i had full support and factory bikes again and i was like man life life's good and you know i, I was uh back to where I wanted to be, um, you know, kind of when I said I, I was going to chase after my Supercross dream again. Nice. Well, I was telling a, a, a mutual friend of ours named Chris Elliott that uh, I think your fastest days are ahead of you still and on a 450. So how old are you now, Cole? <laughs> 29, getting old, getting up there. Yeah, but I still think you got some, something to show and prove on the, in the 450 when that happens. So that's going to be good to see. But uh, all right, buddy, we'll... Uh, Man, thanks for the chat. Uh, safe travels out west and back and then back west. And uh, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, man. Yeah, you too. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure we'll catch up at some point this year. Oh, yeah. You know, you know the red van will be rolling up. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just like old times. <laughs> All right, Cole. Thanks for your time, buddy. Uh, good luck, and we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Billy. Okay, bye-bye.